and welcome to Myth Monsters. My name is Erin and I'll be your host for these little snack bite sized podcasts on folklore and mythical monsters from around the world. These podcasts focus on the actual cryptids, folklore and mythic monsters from global mythology, rather than focusing on the full stories of heroes and their big adventures. I'll also be dropping in some references that they have to recent culture, and we can see these represented in modern content so that you can learn more and get as obsessed as I am about these absolute legends of the mythological world. Ooh, it's nearly spooky time, and I'll be honest, I'm really not ready. Although I do have spooky decorations and bed sheets on, it really doesn't feel like it's time already. This year is absolutely flying by, and I'm very excited to be going to MCM Comic Con in London for the first time this week. So if you do see a ginger with a Myth Monsters hoodie on, please come say hello. And then next week, I'm off to California for BlizzCon. So if you do see me there, please do the same. But a very busy few weeks ahead. We have an amazing special announcement at the end of this episode two for Halloween next week. So I hope you're excited for our annual celebration of all things scary and spooky and that will be coming on Halloween itself rather than the usual Thursday. But this week we are heading over to Asia with an interesting monster from South Korean mythology. Yes, we are looking at the Dokebi this episode. So what is this monster? If you're into Korean anime or manga, you may already know but the Dokebi are basically a goblin-like monster but are sometimes known as nature spirits or deities. The Dokebi are generally described as goblins, but there is a lot more to them than that. They have their own different variants of this monster, all of which have their own look, so I'll go through them with their Korean names. Bear in mind this might be quite a lot if you don't speak Korean. So we'll start off with the Gaxi and the Chonggak Dokebi, which are known to be human looking with either a yellow or green pallor to their skin and they're roughly the same size as people, generally considered to be extremely attractive to us as well. The Onan Dokkabi are known to have one eye and are more traditionally goblin looking, whilst the Odari Dokkabi are again goblin looking but only have one leg and are extremely fond of wrestling. All of these monsters, though, are particularly hairy, red-faced with pointed ears, fangs, horns, and large, wide eyes. They also all wear the traditional Korean dress called the hanbok, which is a super colourful dress with a very, very high waistline, so it comes just underneath the pectorals, and simple embellishments such as lines of stitching decorating it. So kind of stripy, I suppose. They are known to be fearsome and terrifying, as well as awe-inspiring no matter what the type may be, presenting as bright blue flames as they appear whilst wielding a very ferocious looking club. These monsters are usually spirits in a tangible form, but they are not formed in death like usual spirits or even ghosts, but by the spiritual possession of an object such as a broom, a hoe, or any other inanimate, normal object that has human blood spilled upon it. However, their demeanour is definitely an interesting thing about them too, as they do come in their different variants for this. They are usually known as harmless creatures, with absolutely no alignment, so very, very neutral if we are talking D&D terms. However, there are some of them that will actively try and put you out. The two types that you are most likely to run into are the Cham Dokkabi, which are mischievous goblins who tend to play tricks on humans, and the Gay Dokkabi, who are evil goblins who actively feed off of human misery. There are a few other variants of Dokkabi that I haven't mentioned yet though, such as the Go Dokkabi, who are exceptional at weapon fighting, close combat, and actually are really good with arrows. There's also the Kim Seobang Dokkabi, who are basically dumb farmers, and the Nat Dokkabi, who only appear during the daytime. And we mentioned the Gaski and the Chongak Dokkabi before, but they also have powers of seduction whilst being the more attractive ones, which I think is pretty interesting and kind of puts them more on the neutral evil path, I think. In terms of powers to do any of these things, 
It's why they're really considered to be nature spirits. It's believed that they are born with supernatural powers that they can use based on their alignment, such as bringing good harvests, big catches or great fortunes to humans, as well as defending them from evil spirits or evil Dockerby themselves if they are good. On the contrary, the evil side could bring death and disease, and it was believed that they carried smallpox around Korea, as well as fire and general destruction. They could also haunt a person to give them a certain mental illness, and a shaman would be brought in to drive the Dockerby away. They would also reward humans for good deeds and punish them for bad ones, so of course reinforcing the folklore rule of morality which is really strong within most of our monsters that we cover. They are mostly nocturnal creatures, and would only really bother you in the night, so it was a good way to keep out of their path if you just stayed in. If you did bump into a slightly friendly Dockerby in the wilds though, you would most likely be challenged to a wrestling match, or in Korean it's a serium, for the right to pass them. They are incredibly good at wrestling, and so it was unlikely that you would win unless you took advantage of the weakness of the variant of Dockerby you ran into. Of course, you've got the one with the missing leg or the missing eye, so you could take advantage of their proneness to fall over or not being able to see peripherally, or they could just miss something on their right side. But all Dockerby do have a weakness on their right side when they're wrestling, so you could also take advantage of that too. If you did win said wrestling match, you would be given a magical item, such as a gamtu or hat, which gave you the powers of invisibility, a magic club or bangmangi, which was like a magic summoning wand, and of course, you were allowed to pass them. The only catch with the wand was that you could only summon something that was physically there, so you couldn't pull something that didn't exist or was from the ether but you could summon it to your location, so you could technically be stealing someone something. But you could also appease the Dockerby with their favourite foods, such as buckwheat jelly, red bean rice cakes, and sorghum, which is a type of cereal plant, and they would happily move out of the way for you whilst they munched on their little snacks. Moving on to etymology, Dockerby is its own word within the Korean language, and very literally means goblin from what I can tell at least with my research. All of the different variants do have their own translations though, so we'll go through them. So cham means really, gay means wild, kim sobang means Mr. Kim, nat means day, go means high, gaxi means maiden, chongak means bachelor, onun means one-eyed, and Odari means one-legged. So they are all very literal and obviously end all of these with Dockerby to get their specific translations. Now the word goblin though comes from Latin, it comes from the word goblinius, which means devil or demon, but it was translated into Anglo-Norman in England in the 14th century into what we know it as today. Of course goblins are their own creatures unto themselves, which we'll get more into later. Now, in terms of history, the first documentation of Dockerbys were in the Silla era within Korean history, from a book called Samguk Yusa, or Memorabilia of the Three Kingdoms, which was written all the way back by a monk in 1281. But what we do know is that this most likely is a folktale that started way before this. They were mentioned many times during the Joseon period as well, which was all the way from 1392 all the way up until 1897, which in historical terms and mythological terms is actually really recent. Unfortunately though, I couldn't find most of the stories mentioned, or at least I couldn't find copies of them, so I have a single story for you that I found in my research of them, and I hope you enjoy it. One day, an old man lived alone on a mountain, and a Dockerby visited his house. The kind old man was very surprised, but welcomed him in with a boozy drink where they became fast friends. The Dockerby would visit his friend in the mountain very often, and they would just chat, but one day the old man took a solo walk into the woods 
and in the river he saw that he was slowly becoming a Dockerby in his reflection. So the man came up with a plan and invited the monster back, asking him, What are you most afraid of? The Dockerby answered, Blood, of course, and asked him the same back, where the old man said, Why money? It's why I live alone in the mountains, away from everyone. The next day, the man slaughtered a cow and poured its blood all over the house. And when the Dockerby came back, it was terrified and angry and said, I'll be back with your greatest fear. The next day, the Dockerby brought bags of money and threw it at the old man. And the Dockerby never came back, stopping the transformation for the old man and making him the richest person in town. Now, in terms of comparisons here to real life subjects, it gets a bit tricky. However, we do know where the inspiration for goblins in the UK and across Europe came from, and that is from the very real exploitation of children and disabled people all the way back from the Middle Ages up until the Industrial Revolution, as they would very often be sent out to do the nitty gritty and dirty work in caves, woods, mines, forests, in the dead of night so that no one would see them. So it became a rarity to spot a working child, for example, and seeing one would be considered a bad omen, and of course they'd usually be covered in soot or some kind of greenery, mud, so they did kind of look extraterrestrial, I suppose. Or they would be misidentified as fairies or fae, which goblins are considered a part of within at least English folklore, much like brownies, hobgoblins, dwarves and gnomes. Now that does bring me round to mythical creatures too, because as well as all of these creatures, all of which do have their own episodes and if they do not already, they will get one. But the leprechaun is actually one that is very often brought in as a comparison to the Dockerby as they practice morality-based magic on the person who finds them. They are also really similar to the Spanish and Iberian Duende, which also went across to Latin America as Tata Duende, and the Philippines and Mariana Islands as the Duende, which is spelt with a W instead of the Spanish U. These monsters were again very neutral and small in size, but would often reflect the intentions of their human counterpart with the gift that they would bestow upon them. Now, I have covered leprechauns in a previous episode not too long ago, and the Duende from all of these places will be covered in one later down the line. Don't you worry. I do have to say that culturally within South Korea, though, these monsters are still massively believed in, and they've made their way into popular culture and across the world by their biggest and best export. Of course, I am talking about K-pop. The Dockerby are the topic for at least four hit songs from various K-pop artists, including CLC, Stray Kids, Ace and Zykers. I do not listen to K-pop, so I'm saying all of these hoping that someone might know them and be like, ah, that's amazing. Welcome to Tabletop. My name is Nick, and I think that fudging dice rolls is totally okay. Hey, it's me, Franco, and rolling for initiative sucks. I'm Daniel, and I think you should modify your first level characters as much as you want. And I'm Shade, and if your TTRPG hasn't evolved into a LARP, you've done it wrong. And we all host Tabletop, a TTRPG podcast about all things games and storytelling. And sometimes we have game designers, professional researchers, and even the occasional owlbear. If this interests you, listen to Tabletop every Every Monday, wherever you get your podcasts. Tabletop is a proud member of the Helios Network. All this talk of K-pop and, of course, the lovely Tabletop podcast moves us very nicely onto modern media. I'm going to cover goblins as a majority of this, as Dockerby themselves are a little bit elusive within media, but they are covered in a few things specifically which I will shout out for you. But for art... I would really recommend independent stuff this week. I found some really cool pieces whilst researching these monsters, so I really highly recommend that you do the same. Otherwise, there are some statues you can look at from around Korea, but of course, they don't have names, so you're going to have to be researching for a little bit to find them. In movies, we have Lord of the Rings, Hobgoblins, The Field Guide to Evil, The Hobbit, 
animated version that is, The Black Cauldron, The Princess and the Goblin, Sleeping Beauty, The Hobbit and Unexpected Journey, Strange Magic, Gremlins, Labyrinth, Troll 2 and Legend. For TV, we have, specifically for Dockerby, Guardian the Lonely and Great God, but for others, we have Overlord, Goblin is Very Strong, Goblin Slayer, The Legend of Snow White, Re-Monster, That Time I Got Reincarnated as a Slime, Grimgar, A Fantasy in Ash, So I'm a Spider, So What, Mickey Mouse Funhouse, Peter Grill and the Philosopher's Time, Digimon Frontier, Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, Merlin, Star Trek, Power Rangers Mystic Force, Adventure Time, Gravity Falls, My Little Pony, Lego Elves, The Secret of Elvendale, The Real Ghostbusters, Spider-Man, American Dragon, Jake Long, Franklin, Star vs. The Forces of Evil, Legend of the Three Caliberos, Fangbone, Troll Hunters, and Little Bear. Now, for video games, we have one such as Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Siege and Doke V for Docker B specifically, but for others within this category, there is Warcraft, World of Warcraft, RuneScape, Baldur's Gate, Valheim, Mass Effect, Lord of the Rings Online, Okami, The Legend of Zelda, Neverwinter Nights 2, Fable, Guild Wars, Enclave, Gigantic, Diablo 3, Elder Scrolls, Dragon Fable, Loop Hero, Of Orcs and Men, Paladins, Overlord, Terraria, Rogue, Wildstar, Pokemon, Metopia, Goblins. It's got three eyes, so that's the specific. Griswold the Goblin, Final Fantasy 11, 13, and 14, Dwarf Fortress, Dragon's Dogma, Age of Wonders, Battle for Westnoth, and Corruption of Champions. Now, my book recommendation for this week is Korean Children's Favourite Stories, Fables, Myths, and Fairy Tales by Kim So Un and Jeong Yong Sim for some younger listeners and their parents. But I'd also recommend Korean Folk Tales, Imps, Ghosts, and Fairies by Elena N. Grand for the older readers who want to know more about specifically monsters and their places within their folk tales. But now it's time for. Do I think they existed? Hmm, I'm not too sure about this one, honestly. It seems to me that it would be extremely rare to bump into one, and considering the amount of information I could find, I'm not sure they're too common. But with K-pop stars singing about them, how could I argue? But I am going to argue, I'm going to say no, I don't think they existed. I do think the idea of goblins within any culture is fascinating, And to be honest, any creature that lives in order to perform tricks on humans? I mean, we're a pretty dumb race, but are we that gullible? Obviously don't answer that, because the answer is definitely yes. But this monster type feeds into my fantasy-loving heart, with goblins being the most common enemy type within every fantasy franchise ever on the planet. So it's nice to be able to see this monster in a new light within a new folklore, acting similarly, but different to the ones within our Western world. But what do you think? Did the Dokubi cause havoc across Korea? Let me know on Twitter, I would love to know what you think about this one. What a fascinating creature we've got to cover this week though. I really enjoyed this one, and it's nice to go over to a lesser covered mythology and folklore, especially from that Western perspective. But of course, K-pop will keep bringing us more mythical gifts, I am absolutely sure. Next week, though, we have a Halloween special coming out on Halloween itself, because why not? I know it's a quick turnaround for your episodes. So keeping in theme with our big monsters for spooky season like we have for the last two years, we are heading out to the wilds of the US Green for a legendary cryptid maybe the most legendary, and I hope you're screaming it at me through your headphones. But yes, we are finally looking at Bigfoot for our Halloween special on Tuesday the 31st. I am so excited. And as always, our spooky specials are a bit longer, but they are also interactive. So please do get involved on Twitter. I will make sure that all of the questions and quiz bits that I've got going will go on there the same day. 
but super excited for this one. But for now, though, thank you so much for listening. It's been an absolute pleasure. If you enjoyed this podcast, please give it a rating on the service you are listening on. I've got the Twitter for any questions or suggestions on what monsters to cover next, and I'd really love to hear from you. The social media handles for TikTok, YouTube, Threads, and Instagram are Myth Monsters Podcast, and the Twitter is Myth Monsters Pod. But all of our content can always be found at MythMonsters.co.uk, and you can find us on Good Pods, Buy Me a Coffee, and Patreon if you want to help me fund the podcast too. Come join the fun though, share this with your pals. They might love me as much as you do. But for now, stay spooky. And I'll see you later, babes. <laughs> <laughs>